Hi, welcome to our show today. Folks, we got a great show lined up. We're gonna be talking about systematic risk or beta, just more, more financial jargon, limit and stop orders, what are they about, required minimum distributions, the sunken cost trap, how you can get caught up in that, and then rental income. You, you're gonna love it, so stay tuned. Retiring Well, brought to you by Centennial Wealth Advisory, financial advisors, specializing in retirement planning and serving all of Northern Michigan. Retiring well, helping you plan for a successful and comfortable retirement. Retiring well, plan to retire well. Have you ever heard that saying, all ships rise and fall with the tide? Well, in our industry, this is what we call systematic risk or beta, which I'm gonna explain here in just a minute. So here's the, here's the idea. Let's say that I'm in an index fund that's tied to the S&P 500. Okay, this is an index fund that basically owns the S&P 500. Now, if I'm comparing that with the benchmark itself or the index S&P 500, you would expect that index fund is going to be is going to go just like with the market, right? So if you see the S&P 500 rise, you know, 2-3%, you're going to see that index fund rise 2-3% for the most part, right? Think of a mutual fund that's made up of large company stocks. If a large portion of those stocks are the S&P 500, you would also believe that if the S&P 500 went up two, 3%, that most likely that mutual fund invested in the same would rise about the same. This is what we call systematic risk. The idea that, if, that, that your portfolio is gonna be pretty much going with the market. Now, that's a good thing if the market's cooperating. You know, if I see the market do well I'm, I, and I'm watching that benchmark, I know my portfolio it did well, right? But what if it's the opposite? What if I'm watching, you know, the market going down? I could probably expect my portfolio to be going down right along with it. Now, the ideal thing would be to have it go up with the market, but not have it go down with the market, right? Now, we have the ability to get behind any portfolio and actually find out what its beta is, okay, B-E-T-A. What it is, is a, you take a beta of 1.0, and that means that portfolio is basically going right with the market. If the market goes up 2-3%, you can pretty much expect that portfolio to go up by 2-3%. If it's down by 2-3%, you should expect it to be down by two, three percent. Now, a beta score of less than one, okay, maybe you say it's 0.8, means that it's gonna be less riskier than the market. So, market's up two, three percent, yours should only be up one, two, all right, or and vice versa on the downside. Now, a beta score of 1.0 or more means that the portfolio is more riskier than the market. So it's gonna do, possibly do even better than market, but probably do even worse than the market. So knowing the score is very important because if you have a well-diversified portfolio and at the end of the day it has a beta score of one and it's pretty much just tracking the market, well, if that's what you want it to do, that's a good thing. But if it's on the downside, if it's not what you want to do, maybe that's a bad thing. So I encourage you, if you're somebody that, that doesn't know that score, doesn't know how your portfolio would operate as it's compared to the market, then give us a call. We'll gladly analyze that portfolio and tell you what your beta score is. Hi, my name is Larry Flynn. I'm a financial advisor, senior partner here at Centennial Wealth Advisory. Listen, with this coronavirus, it created unprecedented times. High unemployment, you got a lot of businesses not reopening. Whether there comes a treatment or a vaccine for this disease, we don't know. There's just a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty. But your financial well-being is still very important. And if you're in retirement and your retirement, then getting some good sound financial advice is, is gonna be critical. So in these unprecedented times, we're understanding that safety is a concern, and so we're offering a couple options. If you're willing to talk by phone or wanna do a virtual meeting, whether that be Zoom or something like that, we're offering that ability to do that. If you're somebody that does wanna meet in person, we're trying to accommodate that as well. We're saying, you know, we're not gonna have any two clients meet at once. We're sanitizing it before and after you're here, and we're keeping the proper social distancing in place while we meet. So if these are a couple options you might want 
to pursue, we encourage you to just give us a call on the number that's on the screen or visit our, our website at sun-wealth.com and, and just basically you can set up a meeting there. Stay safe. If you have some financial concerns and need to address those, then certainly give us a call. Hi, listen, in this segment, I wanna to talk to you about what's called limit orders and stop orders. Now, what these are, are these are orders or that you're able to set with stocks that'll allow that stock to be sold or bought in either direction. Okay, now there's a difference between these two. These can be kind of complex, but I'll try to, try to keep it simple. First of all, a limit order is where you get to set the minimum or maximum amount. Okay, so if you have a stock, you know, selling right now at $100 a share, um, but you want it to be sold if it reaches a price of, let's say, $102 a share, then you can actually set that dollar amount. Okay, so that what that does is that acts like instructions to the broker to, if it reaches that price, to sell it off at that price if there's a willing buyer. Now a stop order is a little bit different. This is where you set a trigger, okay? So same thing, let's say you have a stock at $100 and you, you, you set a stop order at 102, okay? So if it reaches 102 or more, then it, that, as soon as it hits that 102, it creates a trigger and now that, that execution is at, out at the market. So whatever the price is that you can get it at market. Now, it could run up higher. You know, the trigger is at 102, but by the time, you know, the stock is sold off, maybe, maybe it was 103, 104. Now, it happens the opposite on the other side, too, when you're, when you're trying to buy or sell. So anyway, um, the difference when a limit order is done is that a limit order can be seen by everybody else. Okay, um, so that, that $100, $102 that you're willing to pay out there, that's out there for everybody to see. With a stop order, it's not. Nobody sees that trigger. On a limit order, um, it can be partially some of the stock sold or, or, or not at all or any of it. So it can be partially or, or fully done. But um, you, you may not, it doesn't guarantee that, you know, the, that all of those shares are going to be executed. That could be a disadvantage. Um, with a stop order, it, it's all going to be filled. You don't have to worry about that. Now, um, when you're looking at stop orders, you can do it as a dollar amount. You can do that 102, or you can do it as a percentage, you know, in either direction, okay? Um, you gotta be careful with stop orders and only because that if you create a trigger, um, if there's a lot of volatility, maybe it triggers and gets sold off uh, when you didn't want it to. Um, that, that can happen. Um, limit orders tend to cost more um, because there's somebody that actually has to execute the trade, so you got that. Um, you can have trailing stop losses as a percentage. Let's say I buy a stock and I wanna put a trailing stop loss of 25% on it. That means as it runs up, that 25% is always applying. So um, that can be advantageous. So there's a number of reasons why you want to do these. Um, let's say you have a large concentration in one stock. Well, maybe you want to protect yourself because you don't have diversification. You might do that. Maybe you're speculating on a stock. Maybe you want to say, hey, I'm going to take a chance on this stock, but if it doesn't do bad, or if it does do bad, I've got a stop loss on it so I can cover my losses. Um, maybe I already, I've already i taken a win on a stock, think it's going to run up even more, but I want to put a bottom to it just in case. Folks, um, these, these can be very valuable. If you're somebody that can use that, or if you have a large concentration and want to see how to protect yourself, give us a call. You know, Art, it seems like we're always talking about risk, right? And, and Larry's talking about this systematic risk. And, and basically, I think of like how all ships rise and fall with the tide where, hey, if the, if the S&P 500 is going up and if you're seeing your portfolio go up along with it, then you're pretty much mimicking that benchmark. And just like we talk about uh, S&P 500, there's a number of other benchmarks out there uh, that, that you can track as well. Maybe you want to track a certain sector of the market. Uh, such as technology or the, the travel industry. And, and so you're going to experience, if you're tracking that, maybe using an exchange-traded fund where you're going to see that, that uh, position rise and fall depending on what the market is doing. So again, just something you want to be paying attention to when evaluating your portfolio. Right, John. You know, most people don't mind systematic risk when the market's going up, right? I mean, when oftentimes when you're watching that there and you see the Dow or the S&P going up, 
and, and they don't mind that. But more so when that's going down or we're having a declining market is when that diversification is, is really important and you wanna be certain you understand that, that risk that you have and how that's tracking, how that systematic risk is tracking for you. Sometimes diversification can be frustrating because maybe like we've seen back uh, last year when the tech sector was really hot, you had a few stocks that were doing so well, but maybe your portfolio wasn't. Well, you were probably diversified in a way where you weren't all holding just those couple stocks. When we get into um, talking about stop losses and stuff that Larry then with that second one, uh, that's you know interesting when we have that because that gets into that financial jargon that you know some people really get confused on, but it's interesting that those are used more often than you would know. And for those self traders out there, it's a, it's a possibility you can do. Yeah, one of the ways though that you wanna be careful of that is sometimes you can put in that request saying, hey, if it, if it drops to a certain point or if it reaches a certain high that you wanna sell at that point. And so sometimes you, you may put that in at one point thinking, well, I want to get out either when it drops here or when it gets up here, but then maybe you change your mind or you see different things that come up. So uh, again, thanks for listening on, on all this fun stuff, uh, risk and, and stop losses, uh, but stay tuned. We've got a lot more coming up. Are you drawing closer to retirement or already retired? Do you feel confident that you have a plan in place for your retirement? At Centennial Wealth Advisory, we believe there are a number of areas within your retirement plan that must be working together. It's very important that you have a long-term income plan. You don't want to run out of money in retirement. And we believe that tax planning should go hand in hand with your income planning. So we have our very own accountant on the team to assist you. We also believe that you need to have your estate planning in order to ensure that your assets are left behind to your loved ones and or charities. Along with that comes insurance planning, whether that's life or health. Along with all of this obviously comes your investment planning, which you need to have confidence will help you accomplish your goals and objectives. As you can see, there's a number of areas that you need to be taking into consideration when it comes to your retirement planning. We'd love the opportunity to share with you how we approach all of these areas within your retirement plan. Please call the number on your screen. In this segment, I want to talk to you about required minimum distributions, or what we call RMDs. Now, what are they? You have to understand, if you're in an IRA, um, this is an account that you put in with pre-tax dollars. Okay, it grew tax deferred, so no tax has ever been paid on, on, on this account. And now, who's there that wants to have their money? It's Uncle Sam, all right? So they put an age requirement in that said that once you reach a certain age, you have to start taking money out of these accounts. Now, the old rule used to be 70 and a half. Now, don't ask me where they came up with a half. I, I've never been able to understand that, um, where, where that came from, why they didn't just use a round number, but it was there. So in the year that you turned age 70 and a half, you were required to take a required minimum distribution out. Now, a lot of people say, well, how much is that? It's, it's basically 3.6% of your total IRAs you had as of the last calendar year. And then every year thereafter, based on these lifetime tables, that percentage was growing. So this is money now they're, they're requiring you to take out because why? They want their tax dollars from this, right? Because it's money that's never been taxed. Now with the new SECURE Act that, got, that signed into law in 2019, they've raised that age now to 72. Now they're using a round number, right? So here's the deal, as of January, I'm sorry, December 31st of 2019, any time before that, if you turned age 70 and a half, you fell under the old rule. You, you now have to take required minimum distributions in that year. If you turned 70 and a half after that, after that date, which would be December 31st of 2019 or into 2020, the new rule is you can wait to age 72. That's when you're required to start taking them out. Now, a lot of people like to be able to take those required minimum distributions and give directly to charity. That was allowed under the old law, now it's still allowed under the new law. You can take that required minimum distribution, give it to charity, and then you'll get a 1099 at the end of the year, but it'll be not taxable. 
Now, that's advantageous to somebody who can't itemize their deductions and take charitable contributions. So if you're somebody that's required to take these distributions out, you don't have enough charitable, charitable deductions to be able to itemize with, then that's a great way to give. Just give it directly to charity and then you don't have to pay tax on that income. Now, a lot of people want to try to do the required minimum distribution and make a Roth conversion at the same time. That we can't do. We can't use a required minimum distribution to satisfy a Roth conversion, so that's very important to know. Um, the other thing we'll have if you're that person that fortunately has money doesn't need, need the required minimum distributions, well you can just put it into a savings account or maybe you can direct it to life insurance that can maybe you know, leave a big, bigger legacy to your heirs. So if you're somebody that just wants to know about more about the required minimum distributions, then I encourage you, give us a call. We'll gladly sit down and show you how they work and see if it's beneficial to you. Your grandchildren are precious to you. They are your life. This is your time to have that special relationship. Taking care of yourself is taking care of them. Centennial Wealth Advisory is offering a free, no obligation retirement review to make sure you don't run out of money during your retirement. Centennial Wealth Advisory, your best is yet to come. I want to talk to you about what's called the sunken cost trap. Now this is a mindset we can get ourselves caught up in when, when it has to do with purchases and the like. Let me give you an example so you can, you can kind of better understand this. Think of that vehicle you might have owned in the past. You know, it might have been older, you didn't have, you didn't have the money to get a new vehicle, so you're, you're buying this car, you're fixing it up, you're, 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 you're continually putting money into it, and you know in your mind how much money you got into that, that, that vehicle. Now, you, you get to the point, you've got so much money in that vehicle, you don't want to get rid of it because you know how much you have into it. Okay, this is what they, we call the sunken cost trap. Now, what's the problem with it? Well, how we should be looking at that vehicle is, yes, we've got all this money into it, but it is what it is as of today. <laughs> We have to look at it, how is it going to best serve us from, from this day forward? If there is another vehicle I can get into that can serve me better, then why would I stay with the one that I've got all this money into? Because again, you have to look at it as it is today. So if there's another vehicle I can get into, it's, gonna, it's not, probably not going to have as much in repairs and it can better serve me going forward, then I'd probably better be able to make that switch, right? Folks, the reason I bring this up is this can happen with individual stocks as well, or maybe our, our uh, mutual fund or the like. We know how much money we put into that instrument, all right? We, and it might have taken a drop, maybe dip down, or whatever the case might be, and now we hold on to it, and, and we think that that's gonna you know, serve us better because of the money we put into it, when maybe the better way to look at it is, is there something else that can better serve me going forward and making that switch? We do this with strategies as well. You know, you could have an investment strategy that you've bought into or, or a, a stock picking strategy that you bought into and you're going to stay with it because you, you know how much effort you've got into it. But if there's something better that you can do going forward that would better serve you forward, then getting stuck in that kind of a mindset could be hurting you. Now, I've watched this happen with sharp, quick losses in the market. Um, we had one not long ago in the fourth quarter of 2018. Market dropped very quickly in a very short period of time. I think it was like 16, 17% in just a three month period. And people were afraid to make a move because that was their strategy. They knew what they had into it. And they, they were afraid that if they changed up, they weren't gonna get it back. 
but what they should have been looking at is, what am I in today? What can better serve me going forward? So hopefully you found this valuable. Um, it just giving you kind of an idea how sometimes we, in our own thinking, we can get caught, you know, uh, believing one way when maybe we should be a little bit more open-minded. So hopefully you found value in that. Give us a call if maybe we can be of any help. Well, two really interesting uh, segments there in the show. Hopefully you caught that information, required minimum distributions and sunken costs. You know, two things that maybe aren't too fun, but I want to talk for a second about required minimum distributions. This uh, last week, I spent a great amount of time with some uh, new clients of ours talking through tax planning specific to their IRAs. And one thing that we did is we said, okay, these folks were in their early 60s, so obviously they're about 10 years away from taking required minimum distributions. And we looked at, what if you took no IRA money out, roughly what would those be worth at that time and what would your tax cost to be to them at that time? They were blown away, these folks, John, they were going to have to pay from the age of 72 to 90 over a million dollars in federal taxes just with no tax planning. So what we did then is walk through what are some Roth conversions to avoid these huge RMDs later in life. And folks, if you're not doing that and you're not looking ahead, you're in your 60s, you haven't started those required minimum distributions, please, this is something you need to be looking at. Your tax costs can be dramatically different if you do some planning. Potentially, uh, not everybody can benefit, but some people can. So, John, I think as we talk about tax planning all the time on the show, uh, this is one of those things that's vital. Yeah, for sure, Art. And, and not just for your personal taxes, but if you're potentially leaving money behind to children, grandchildren, then, then the tax ramifications of that money over time. But the other area that Larry was talking about is the sunken, uh, sunken costs and everything. And I think of like the old vehicle that, that you have and, and how you've been putting money into it thinking, well, eventually I'll get it back up and running the way I want to, but you may be putting way more than you want into that. But just like with stocks, there's certain uh, certain clients that we know where they've held these stocks for so long and they think, well, eventually it's going to come back up. And we've just, you know, they, they wanted to hold that because maybe they work for that company um, and, they, and they feel really attached to it. But uh, it's one where we look at from, a, again, coming back to a tax perspective where what if that's after-tax money and, and you maybe you have some unrealized losses? It might be a good time potentially to realize some of those losses to, to at least write off some of the taxes. You may not ha have to sell it in full, but maybe selling a portion. So again, we got a lot more coming up, so stay tuned to Retiring Well. forward to helping you plan to retire well. In this segment, I want to talk to you about rental income. Okay, very, very important. It can be a valuable part of a, um, a retirement plan too, as I'll explain. First of all, when you're looking at rental property and you want to know if it'll be good rental income, you're going to have to know some numbers. First of all, you're going to have to calculate what you think is going to be your the rent you're going to receive. Okay, um, so you get a good idea how much rent you can charge, and then you want to you know get an idea what are what costs are you going to have to incur taxes, insurance, um, whether you pass the utilities on or not. You know what is what are those costs going to be? Because what you want to get to is you want to get to what's called the net benefit you know that'd be your gross rental income after all your expenses and what am I going to get as a net benefit in rent okay the next thing you want to do is what's the amount you're going to be paying for this property or what if you already own it what is the fair market value of that property okay so if I get that net rent benefit and make that a yearly number and then I divide that by the fair market value or purchase price of the rental property I'm trying to purchase now what you're going to get is a rate of return 
okay? So let's say you get a rate of return of, let's say it ends up being seven, eight percent. Well, you're gonna look at that's gonna be very, very good rate of return, right? Um, how much risk do I gotta take in the market just to get maybe that same number? So that's gonna be valuable to know. So when you're looking at rental property, please look at it, at it first that way. The other thing you get with rental property is if it gives you a good rate of return, we're not even factoring in appreciation. You know, if that, that property goes up in value, you, you, that you can add that to your rate of return. So let's just assume you say 1%, 2%, you know, appreciation. Now that, that 7% is 8, 9%. So that's, that's a good number to know. The other nice thing about um, rentals is you get to depreciate them, you know, over a number of years. Typically, I'll find with rental property that that depreciation is enough to offset the net rent. So in a lot of cases, you're paying very little or no taxes on that income as, as, you, as you own it. Now, you, you, the bad thing about depreciation is when you depreciate it from a tax standpoint, now your basis is lower and later on when you sell it, you've got this you know, huge capital gain because now all that depreciation has to be recaptured as, as basically income. But if you have that rental property and you pass it on as an inheritance, guess what? They get stepped up basis on it and then no tax ever had to be paid on it. The other nice thing about rental income is it's inflationary. <laughs> you get to raise rent, so as, as costs go up, you get to raise the rent. So if you've got it as a retirement instrument, it's going to be a good income source for a long, long time. Now rentals can be a headache. You can pass that headache on to a, a manager too. Um, typically they'll take anywhere from 15, 20%, but if you don't want that headache, could be valuable. Hopefully you found this segment valuable. Um, if, you, if you have any questions about this, give me a call. Really glad Larry brought up rentals. Art, as you know, I, I love rental property. It's something that uh, my wife and I own, my, I, my parents have owned in downtown Traverse City for a long time. And, and so it's one that, uh, it, it's a moving market though. As, as we're all experiencing, uh, we're seeing the residential markets moving up, commercial real estate though at this point in time, you know, with the pandemic and, and how businesses are adapting to a lot of employees working remotely has really drastically changed things. And so it's one that with, with rental Rental properties. Obviously, you want to find the location that's important with any type of real estate, but it's also one where you want to make sure that that cash flow is going to be working for you. I mean, an ideal world, you're paying down that debt as, as quickly and best as you can, just like with your own personal real estate, uh, just to increase that cash flow. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages uh, of holding real estate for a long term, but again, you want to be careful of what you're getting into and make sure that it's the right property for, for you. Absolutely, John. And also, too, how does that factor into your retirement plan, your retirement income plan? You know, folks usually have rentals to generate some income, hopefully get some appreciation. How is those numbers matching up for what your needs and all your expense goals are with your other assets, taxes, all of that sort of stuff? You know, here at Centennial Wealth Advisory, when we sit down with people, we're not just looking at stocks and bonds and mutual funds. All this stuff plays a role here. John, we're not out actively selling commercial real estate, but guess what? That may be a part of your plan, and that needs to be factored into that retirement income income plan because that's your lifestyle. That's what's going to allow you to do the things that you want to do in retirement. So it's vitally important that all of those pieces are directly associated with your retirement income plan so you can plan to retire well. Thanks for joining us this week on the show. We hope that you learned lots and took great notes um, on all the different topics that we've covered. Uh, for for you out there that maybe are interested in, in getting some more information and learning more about your retirement, give us a call at the number on the screen. We'd love to hear more from you. We'll talk through it at No Obligations, free visit here. Uh, our law offices are located in Traverse City, Gaylord, Petoskey, and Cadillac, or you can visit us at send-wealth.com. Have a great week. See you again.